reject coups, President Muhammad Buhari tells world leaders, and insecurity rages as several persons are killed in two separate attacks in Kaduna State. This is Plus Politics, and I am Mary Anakon. President Muhammad Buhari has told world leaders to reject coup d'etat, especially in West Africa. President Buhari decried the recent trend of unconstitutional takeover of power, saying it must not be tolerated by international community. He urged the international community not only to deal with the symptoms of conflict, but also to immediate, also the immediate causes that fuel the conflict in the first place. He said these and more in his speech at the 76th session of the United Nations General Assembly in New York. President Buhari warned that democratic gains of the past decades in West Africa are now being eroded due to those negative trends. But joining us to discuss this is political analyst at Chike Chude, Richard Wokocha. He's an associate professor of public law, River State University, and at Taguba Abuje, who's also a legal practitioner. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having us. Yes. I'm going to start with you, Professor Wokocha. Um, let's start by considering the root causes of these coup d'etat. Now, let's not forget that in the past three months, if not in the past year, we've seen several attempted and successful coups. Uh, there was one in Mali. Um, we've seen the one that just happened uh, with, our, with Alpha Conde. Uh, and there have been several others. Let's look at the root causes because, yes, just as the president has said, we need to say no to these coups, but how do you avoid these coups uh, from taking place if we do not address the core reasons or the causes? Somewhat difficult. Um, coups are potentially and essentially political activities. And um, they are more likely to happen where you have um, circumstances that can be pleaded as reasons why quote and unquote patriots are intervening. Now, if you check a number of the countries in which this has happened, that's not to say that it's limited to such countries, uh, you will find that um, what others take for granted in other parts of the world, the right to choose and change your government from time to time, uh, is one that is not really available in those places. Uh, in some of them, yes, you have the regular um, ritual of elections, uh, but the same persons return themselves over and over again. Uh, and so if you have bad government, you have bad economy, and people cannot see any uh, progress, any reason to continue with the circumstances in which they find themselves, you create room for adventurers uh, to seize advantage of that environment you have created. Uh, to brand themselves patriots who are intervening in the interest of the people. Every suffering people will always rejoice if what appears to them, even if it is just on the surface, uh, to be a symbol of their hardship is taken away. Uh, there will always be some level of support uh, for such activities. So I think bad governance and very poor democracy, because the people have the right to change their government and they see that right being implemented by them, they will hold themselves responsible if they are not choosing the right people. Uh, but in the situations where we have where uh, dictators change constitutions and uh, give themselves opportunity to contest more and more times, as it has happened in a number of those countries, we can be sure you will have thousands of people in the streets uh, celebrating whenever these kind of activities happen. But it's not in our interest. And somehow we must find a way to deal with it. Hmm. Achike, um, there seems to be similarities in most of the coups that have happened lately. Uh, again, I go back to the latest, which is the one that happened in Guinea. Now, you saw the number of people that flooded the streets right after the coup happened. It seemed like the people were on the side of the soldiers, or rather the army, uh, no matter how, you know, um, violent it seemed, even though um, it seemed like the people were very excited about it, maybe because their voices were not heard by the government. Uh, the civilian government, or maybe because they themselves were tired, but they keep talking about the fact that the, there was high-handedness in these governments, and we we we, we tend to see that happen across um, you know the countries in Africa. 
But then we are the same people who have been asking for independence. We have gotten independence, but we become enslaved again by the leaders who swore to protect and serve us. Why is that? Well, I think uh, you, you, you just uh, talked about, mentioned that um, part of the reason, I think the professor has also talked about that. Uh, the reality is that, um, you know, there, is, there are certain expectations when it comes uh, to the issue of governance, it comes to issues of uh, democracy. Uh, democracy is not exactly the magic one, but there are certain, you know, minimum expectations by a people uh, who have willingly gone out uh, to express themselves uh, through the electoral process by voting in uh, leadership. They expect these leadership, this political leaderships to carry out certain essential duties and responsibilities as enunciated by their own constitution, the welfare and the security of uh, the people of the state. And uh, in most cases, um, they have not been able to achieve that. And so the people will begin to question even the basis of um, all of the you know, elections and their participation within that process itself. And then so when you now mix it up with some of the things that the Nigerian president talked about, uh, the you know, uh, human rights abuses in a democratic dispensation, uh, poverty that is supposed to be solved by the politicians, corruption and some other things, inequality and all of those divisions, and so you, all of these things provide a ground or, or basis uh, for any group of military adventurers to come in and make claims, you know, about uh, and also emphasize on the dire situation that they find themselves, the citizens find themselves in, which ultimately, you know, the citizens will definitely agree because that is what we have, the misgovernance that we've had, you know, across the continent of Africa, especially in West Africa. So the president has said a lot of some of these things, but even some of these issues that the president is talking about are also prevalent in his own country, in Nigeria. We are talking about, you know, uh, the you know human rights abuses, the inequality, poverty, and so on, are also things that characterize even uh, the Nigerian state today as it is. Uh, you know, so uh, but do not also forget that uh, the reaction of people really. Uh, it, it's, it's as a result of what they see as a, the failure of political leadership, like I have said, to provide you know a meaningful existence for themselves. You saw it in Nigeria. There is no single coup that took place in this country that did not receive uh, the approval of uh, the citizens of uh, of Nigeria. Even though people will tell you that uh, you know a military rule is an aberration to democracy, it's antithetical to democracy. But in the midst of the people, you question the people would ask is what is the alternative? The alternative is, is bad governors. The alternative are people who change at will at the constitutions of uh, the express constitutions of their of their countries, giving themselves, you know, extending their time, you know, their time limit, and, you know, to remain in government and all that. So, uh, is this feeling of disillusionment really that has led? Uh, to this uh, intervention by the military, of course, military adventure, because they have no solution to the problems that they are trying to, uh, you know, point out. O ultimately, they end up causing, you know, more confusion within their polity. Uh, but it is the misgovernance uh, that the president talks about that is um, also leading uh, to some of these issues. Back to you, um, Professor. Um, the president uh, has been asking that lead leaders reject coup d'etats, uh, an un unconstitutional takeover of power um, by uh, the army. But then let's look at the means that the people have to reach out to their leaders. Again, I take you back to Guinea, which is something I've covered lately. Um, in Guinea, we saw a, d a very bloody protest um, when the president decided to tamper with the constitution and elong elongate his tenure. Now, I'd also like to backtrack to remind you of who Alpha Conde was. He was one of the people who was in opposition to the government of the day. He spoke about a lot of things that he is or was doing when he was in power. And, and so I'm looking at it from the people's perspective. How do the people get justice? How do the people get um, a responsible government if every means that they try, every means that should be available to them to get government to be accountable and get dividends of whatever it is, whatever they call a democracy in their domain, uh, is stifled or they cannot have access to it. Um, does this not, of course, open the doors to these um, soldiers? Even though, again, there's a downside, we all know, uh, to soldiers taking over power. But we tend to see that the people's hands are tied. So how do the people get their governments to be responsible or hear them when all those all those channels are being plugged. 
So you see, I, I think that rejection, you know, should start with the with the with the citizens of the countries concerned that we are talking about. That rejection should because governance is about the citizens, you know. So and so when you have and, and so citizens should have the primary responsibility of looking after their country. You know, like somebody has said that the price we have to pay for democracy is eternal vigilance. So citizens must be eternally vigilant about their politics. They should be, you know, uh, make constant demands on their political leadership. Uh, you know, so that is the first step. The second step, really, uh, is for the is is, is uh, maybe for the international community when the leadership, the political leadership, has not lived up to expectation, uh, you know, and then then and then you have this this incursion, you know, this rude incursion into the political life of a country of the country by the military. Then the next stage is first of all a denunciation of that action by the citizens. But unfortunately, like you have said, in this case, you have citizens welcoming, uh, you know, something that is clearly an aberration. And then there is a role that the international community should play. And in fairness to the international community, you know, unlike what we used to have in the past, when some of them were reluctantly welcome uh, people, the Putinists who have been involved in a coup, uh, the, 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 the response usually, in especially seeing the, the, the spate of coups in West Africa in the past one year, the response by the international community has been very serious condemnation of the military, of the action by the militaries, by, by, by the military punchists. You know, and of course we have seen, you know, the the the, the diplomatic moves and maneuvers by international organizations, especially giving support to the regional body, the ECOWAS, to do whatever it is, you know, that should be done, that can be done, to ensure that the coupes do not continue to remain in power. So they have done that, they have always condemned that. But beyond that, you see. There is one fundamental factor that, that our president is forgetting. Nigeria must lead by example. Nigeria is the most populous country in, you know, in Africa. Nigeria is, 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 has the biggest economy in Africa. You know, and there is so much expectation on the shoulders of Nigeria. Unfortunately, Nigeria has not been able to live up to expectation. Why am I saying so? Nigeria has intervened meaningfully. Uh, in the in 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 a coup that has been on, you know undertaken by the militaries of some of these other countries even within Africa, the, we, we've had an intervention in the Central African Republic, one of the countries in Central African Republic that sought to the immediate reversal of a coup that took place because of the enormous pressure that Nigeria brought to bear on that country. Mm -hmm. Then in in West Africa, we remember what we did with regards to Sierra Leone when for the Sanko. And, and some of his rebel, you know, rebel groups took over the government of Sierra Leone. Nigeria, you know, went into Sierra Leone and reversed it uh, with the aid of other West African countries. You know, so uh, the reason why some of these things are happening within, you know, the West African sub-region in our neighboring country is simply because of the weakness of the Nigerian state. Otherwise, if you had a country in Nigeria that is strong and viral, as we had about 25, 30 years ago, the fact that Nigeria has become a democracy, even though it is not exactly working, but the fact that we are running a democracy will not embolden, you know, any of the uh, the, the, the the military, none of these other surrounding West African countries to have done what they have done, and that is the illegitimate takeover of the government of their governments. And so, it is Nigeria's weakness in a way that has also encoded some of the support. And if you look at the resolutions that uh, the ECOWAS, you know, ends up you know, undertaking uh, with uh, some of these, uh, the people, the military actors that were involved in this uh, ill illegitimate overthrow of legitimate governments, you realize that it would appear that they are being rewarded, that is the coupists, are being rewarded for the act of subverting the constitution of their countries. What do I, what, what do I mean by that? The transitional arrangement that is usually put in place between, I mean, by ECOWAS, also involves members of the, of the military, uh, you know, uh, coupists, of, of the coupes that took place, uh, that took part in that coup. So it is a form of rewarding people who have embarked on an illegitimate action by making them involved in the process of seeking, you know, a transitional uh, government. So that is what encourages most of these coupes. Ultimately, at the end of the day, they are going to say, well, the last, I mean, the least that will happen is that ECOWAS is going to get involved in the international community and we're going to be involved in being part of the government that, that is awesome. going to you know, emerge as a result of the transitional program that was put in place. So these are part of the problems that we're having. 
Let's move away from that and talk about some of the things, other things that the president raised. He talked about um, uh, the, he sought for debt cancellation outrightly um, uh, for countries that were facing severe challenges, uh, saying that Nigeria, most importantly, uh, will not um, continue to seek aid. He also spoke of equitable COVID distribution. Let's start with the, the aid part of it and the debt cancellation. The last time we had our debt cancelled, we still had Ngozi Okonjo-Iwala as our Minister of Financing, Finance Minister and the Minister for the Economy. Um, and, and several years down the line, here we are again asking for debt cancellations. But I want to start by asking, um, of course, you're a citizen of this country and you know, of, obviously, the ins and outs of governments and all that they, they've said they're doing. Um, how well do you think that we as a Nigerian state, whether it be the Buhari administration or past administrations, how well have we done when it comes to uh, the, monies, the monies that we borrow uh, and say we want to use for infrastructural development or whatever? How well have we done with those monies? And, and the areas in which we pump these monies into, uh, are there plowback profits? Is it the, is, could they be the re reason why we're unable to pay back our debt? So are we going to blame everything on COVID-19? Well, you know, the, the, the reality is that um, uh, the, the world is not going to save Africa if Africa does, doesn't save itself. Uh, you know, uh, that is the general agreement that Africa has to save itself. Um, and one thing that is also clear is that trillions, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars have been borrowed uh, over the past 50 years in Africa. And we have not seen anything uh, significant in terms of... Um, uh, changing the political and economic landscape of uh, Africa. So aid has not been very useful to Africa. Uh, of course, there are so many issues, I mean, so many reasons responsible for I'm, that. I'm, so, I'm sorry, I, I really, I, I'm yeah. so sorry to speak over you, but when you say aid has not been very useful to us, are you saying we don't need it or we need it, but we're not managing, well, we're not managing it properly? Which, which one is it? Yeah, yeah I, think, I, think it's, I think it's a bit of both. Uh, we, we, we don't for a co continent that is, that, is, that is mightily blessed. Do not forget that uh, most of the major minerals in this world, around which the economies of the globe revolve, are found in Africa. And that's why you have this scramble, this competition between the Europeans, the Americans, and the Chinese uh, for Africa's you know, very rich resources. So, uh, you, you know, and, and that means that if we get our acts right, if we get our politics right, we will be able to harness these resources for the purpose of developing the African continent. And so we do not really, under normal circumstances, have any serious business borrowing money when the essence of, of when, when we have everything that is needed to run the African continent, you know, properly, if only we have people who, are, who can manage uh, the resources. And so when we now find ourselves, even in the situation where we now have to uh, borrow money, what do we do with the money? So I think that also comes to what you have just said, the issue of the prudent management of uh, these resources. And the reality is that most of these monies are stolen and frittered away and mismanaged completely, outrightly. And, 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 and so that's why we have not been able to see anything you know, meaningful about that. We talked about uh, the, you know, what Obasanjo did. Uh, the, the using his clout and that of Okonjo Wala uh, with the international financial, uh, you know, multilateral financial uh, organizations to write off Nigeria's debt. We had a debt profile of around 30, 32 billion dollars then, and then we were asked to pay, you know, a whopping one tranche of 12 billion dollars, which we had, and then pay that, and then we are forgiven 18 billion dollars. How many years down the line? You know, about maybe 15, 16 years down the line, Nigeria is owing a whopping. Uh, uh, 36 billion dollars, and they already there's a representation that has been made by this present government to the National Assembly for an additional 4. Point something to 5 billion dollars. So that will shoot our debt profile to I think around 41 billion dollars. So what it means, you know, is that from 2015 to now, 2015 we had a debt profile of around 11, 12 billion dollars. We have borrowed to about 200 percent of that. You know, at this particular point in time, and we're still borrowing money. So, what have we been able to do with the with the monies that we have borrowed all these years? There's nothing to show for it. Nigeria remains the poverty capital of, of you know of the world. There's gross inequality, you know, you know, and the economic dislocation for a lot of Nigerians and and, and all that. So, when the president is asking the international community, uh, you know, for their forgiveness, it's a joke because they know what is going on in this country. They know the, the quantum of money that has been given you know, the, the, to Nigeria, and they have an idea how, 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 how you know, much 
that these monies have frittered. I have been frittered by the political elites but, in but, the country. But, but this government is a government that, I, I mean, I, don't, I do not know if, you know, but the truth is this government had come in to plug those loopholes, according to their campaign. Uh, they're here to fight corruption and make sure that monies that are allocated for different things go to those areas. So are you saying that um, this government has also, one way or the other, sold its hands in terms of monies that should be uh, allotted it, 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 to... Projects yeah, and implementations. Well, this is not me. This is not me saying it. This is this is Transparency International saying it. Nigeria's position in terms of transparency today is worse than it was in 2015. So, what does that mean? That 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 we have not been having prudent, you know, uh, management of our resources. And so, then the stories of uh, of uh, of a corruption that has gone on unabatedly in the country, you know, all this while. I, I, and so, it, it's it's not me. It is the facts that are on ground, and there is really nothing to show for it. The educational system has not been revamped. The the the, the present government told us they are going to do something about education. They told us they are going to do something about infrastructural infrastructure. They told us they are going to do something. About about so many other things in the country, uh, you, you know, and all of these things have not been done. So telling us that you are going to, uh, you know, plug loopholes and so on. I mean, it, it, it's not in the same, but it's in the it's in the doing. And 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 when it comes uh, to delivering on the promises that they have made to the Nigerian people, we can't really say that they have they have done much in that direction. Corruption has continued, like I just you know made reference to. The latest, I mean, uh, uh, last uh, transparency report of Transparency International about about uh, the the level of uh, corruption in the country. Mm. As, as so, as so we have not really done so much. And so you find a president that is appealing to the international community, a, a president that has not been able to stem the tide of corruption, also telling the international community to forgive us, you know, just as they had forgiven us before. And under him, much more money has been borrowed. You know, than in any in his administration than any other administration or all other administrations put together uh, in this country. So you don't want to give uh, that that kind of uh, that kind of administration, uh, uh, you know, debt forgiveness. They, they okay. must have something on ground uh, to fall back on to know that even if we do this, that these monies are going to be properly managed. And so far, from what they are seeing, there's nothing to show uh, that. Well, finally, let's talk about the COVID aspect of Mr. President's speech. Uh, he talked about, he, he thanks the um, international community and, and the initiatives, the financial institutions, um, you know, for significantly mitigating the situation, um, in, you know, of indebted countries. But then he spoke about the equitable distribution of COVID-19 vaccinations which is a very big issue. It's a front burner issue as we speak right now. And, and let's not forget the fact that the United Kingdom has come up with a, a, a particular pro protocol where they have somewhat um, said that those who, who have been vaccinated in Africa, uh, they do not necessarily consider that vaccination uh, a standard of sorts. And then we have anti-vaxxers here. Oh, Professor, you're back with us. Okay, so let me throw that question yes, to sir. you. Let's talk about the politicization of vaccination, especially in Africa. There is one school of thoughts where there are people who are saying, well, Africa has so much potential. Why aren't we all, we have so many researchers, some of them working within and without Africa. Why are we unable to create our own vaccines that are also of the same standard with the ones that we are getting from, from the UK, from the US? Uh, and then there are also the people who are anti-vaxxers, on the other hand, who have come up with all kinds of conspiracy theories and reasons to why they would not take this COVID vaccination. Now, with what the UK government has said, it calls to question the vaccinations that we're getting from them. Are they giving us um, low standard vaccinations if they're saying that those vaccinations don't qualify us to come into their country without having to uh, quarantine for at least seven to 10 days? Well, I think to the they are, uh, they are trying to play safe. Uh, as you have said, there are a lot of theories, conspiracy theories about uh, uh, the COVID vaccine, uh, COVID-19 vaccine. And um, our indecision is one that has, uh, I think, has attained international recognition. And so if uh, a country is uneasy about uh, travelers from our region, coming into their countries uh, after vaccination, uh, it will possibly be a hesitation arising from the fact that they are not certain 
that we are doing the right thing. Uh, as for the quality of the vaccine that we are getting, remember that we are open to all manner of vaccines and we are receiving more than just uh, more than the vaccine from one particular country. And so I, I wouldn't think it's a function of um, what they are giving us being low. There are a number of them that are available and a number of them that are in use in this country. So if they have doubts about the one they are giving us, I don't think the same doubt can be extended to the one they are, we are receiving from other countries, uh, which people in their country are also receiving and are being counted as having been fully vaccinated. Well, again, the, a lot of African countries seem to be still at the mercy of these other European countries and the Americas as to who gets the vaccination. And there seems to be some politicking to it. What do you think is our challenge here in Africa and why can't we produce our own vaccines? First, on um, who gets what and why we don't seem to be getting enough. You are not, equal, you are not an equal stakeholder here. Um, so, so you're not bargaining at the same level. And uh, definitely you get only after the nations that have the strength of bargain have uh, done so and gotten what they want. So there is no question that we cannot uh, contend at that level and get exactly uh, the same treatment and the same uh, quantity as stakeholders or equal, those that are equal stakeholders with the producers are getting. Now, on why we don't seem to be producing our own, vaccines are scientific productions. Science requires commitment, a lot of funding, and a lot of commitment. Uh, if you look at our attitude, uh, our political environment do not seem to support such commitment and such seriousness. Uh, that's not to say we do not have the minds and we do not have the brains, but do they have the environment? Do they have uh, the facilities with which to do what they need to do? Uh, when they leave these shores, they become inventors and they become great minds outside. But within, I'm afraid they do not have the environment and they do not have the support that they need, uh, as well as the funding that is required hmm. uh, to get those breakthroughs. Uh, productions like vaccines and the rest of them. So it's neither here nor there. We have no strong commitment as a nation or as a region. We have no shown strong commitment uh, to funding and supporting inventiveness and scientific uh, discovery. So we shouldn't expect uh, to discover it the way others are doing or to come by those vaccines the way others are doing. You don't expect to get your ship in if you have not sent one out. We haven't made the investment wow. that produces vaccine. It makes me really think that uh, we might just be begly for a long time until we get our acts right. But I want to say thank you to Professor Richard Wokocha. He's an associate professor of public law, River State University, and Achike Chude, who is a politics uh, analyst. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for being part of the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank All right. You. Well, thank you for staying with us. We'll take a short break now. And when we return, we discuss the insecurity uh, in some parts of the country as several persons have been killed in attacks in Kaduna State with the vaccine.